you, Mariana, um, for having this. Thank you for the long suffering crowd that stays for the last session. Um, I hope will be well rewarded for your endurance and patience. Um, I'm, this is a, a session um, on state investment banks, which um, in many ways is, sorry, I need my little In many ways is the uh, sort of one of the, the cruxes of what a lot of these other discussions have been coming to in, in that uh, um, we, we um, we're thinking about how you need to have patient capital, how you need to have intelligent capital, how the government needs to be an actor. Curiously, all those three, three things come together in state banks, and we're very fortunate here to have um, some representatives from several um, distinguished and successful state banks from the European Investment Bank, um, from BNDES in Brazil, and from KFW um, in, in, in Germany. Um, and there's going to be a little more of this on state banks uh, tomorrow's session um, in a, at 11, the 1110 session, which um, Mariana assures me will be directly on time tomorrow because we won't have any more delays. Um, I just want to start with a very quick comment, um, which starts in a little bit where Adair left off at lunchtime, which is to think about the purpose of finance. Um, we've heard a lot about how finance has gone off-piste. It's um, wandered off into be a kind of self-reflective, narcissistic endeavor that steals money to support its habit of um, trading with itself um, from the rest of the economy. But I think there is a genuine, important purpose of finance. I mean, I don't. This is obviously true, which is indeed to gather economic resources um, in the form of finance, and push them into um, enterprises uh, of one sort or another that are in need of those um, resources or can benefit from them. And that economic purpose, that, that definite service of the economic good, um, as, as, as Adair pointed out and, and has been pointed out several times, has been a bit lost, but it still exists. Um, and it, it has been over the years a um, a enterprise, the financial enterprise, that has been um, very, very profitable for some financiers. Um, genuine provision of capital was very profitable when you were providing capital for ships or for working capital. But now, um, for the last century or so, has often been not that profitable, um, has involved taking a lot of risks, losing a lot of money on a lot of investments, and um, so it's become a different kind of enterprise, um, genuine finance. There are still some genuine financiers who make a lot of money, but there's a lot of room for genuine finance, gathering and allocating resources that, um, I that isn't terribly profitable, um, can be reasonably profitable, but need not be um, dramatically so. And if you think about the three things that financial institutions, intermediaries, financial intermediaries do, they offer maturity transformation, um, well, that, that in terms of gathering investment, that is to say, I bring my investments in, I may be able to cash out um, before the investment's done. They also um, absorb losses, it's like an insurance policy. You invest in many things, um, and that way some of them can lose money, but the original provider of resources still does all right. And they have an informational role. Um, so they know things. They understand industries. They understand companies. They can figure out, give information, get information, use their information to serve the economic good. And I think that if one thinks of these purposes, you can start to realize very strongly why it would be um, useful to have institutions that have the backing of the government, because the government has the financial resources to guarantee, um, uh, uh, to, 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 to work with maturity transformation, the kind of financial nuts and bolts of this. It has um, the scope to, to make it possible to um, absorb losses, and it's a natural place for information to be gathered. So some part or some link with the government 
and finance is not unnatural, as is often claimed by people who like free markets. It's actually the most natural thing in the world. And if you look at the history of banking, the image of banks as private, profit-seeking, greedy institutions bears no relation to the history of modern banking. Most banks around the world were formed for not-for-profit, often by civic or religious organizations, by merchants themselves who would own them as a not-for-profit enterprise, putting their surplus capital in, using surplus capital. Mortgage lending traditionally was done by, in, in a life cycle thing, the young people borrow, the old people lend. The bank itself made very little money, if any. Um, and so if state investment banks are one of the few institutions, types of institutions that still have um, an ethic that's very different from, um, from that uh, of the private sector maxim profit maximization view. And I think with that framework that these are natural institutions you would expect to have in a complex economy, there's a perfectly normal financial role that they play, which is long-term, patient, informed, um, supportive of social goal type lending and funding. Um, and that they are well within the, the sort of history, sort of natural structure of the way banks work in terms of their objectives of returns and, um, and, and profitability structure. Um, so I think that, that they, they fit in well, and I'm looking forward to hearing 10-minute presentations from, um, from each of um, our, our, our speakers. And we're going to start here with uh, Shiva Dastar of the European Investment Bank. Thank you very much. For those of you who were there last night, you heard my two provocations. We are here in the business of uh, rethinking, and what I put to you all is that for the sake of this conference, I have uh, single-handedly decided to rename our institution from the European Investment Bank to the European Innovation Bank. So, um, so this is, I put two provocations to you, one being that we, at least today, will refer to EIB as the European Innovation Bank, and the second one that we should also um, think more broadly about um, funding of innovation, um, not only in terms of grants, but also in terms of blended capital uh, models, and I will give you an example, a taste for what EIB does on that front. So. Um, I think you all hopefully know the EIB, uh, whether it's the investment bank or innovation bank. A lot of you know it from as a, as a large provider of fin financing for infrastructures all over the world, uh, primarily in Europe. Uh, so I won't go into that. Um, we are giving not only funding, but we, as I mentioned, we do lending, and we call it blending. This is what I'm uh, referred to with uh, sort of blending of grants uh, that historically have been, especially in the European Commission uh, budget, and we blend them with our own capital and have therefore uh, more risk absorption, more risk capacity. And we also do advisory. Uh, this is a business that has uh, been further developed. I would like to maybe highlight, I'm, you know, it, we have a distinct, distinguished panel, and I'm very pleased to have actually uh, Mr. Matthias Kolatz an on this, because he was at the time at the EIB the vice president who actually spearheaded a lot of the um, sort of work that has now material vision of having advisory be set up, and therefore I think it's quite nice to have him now back on this panel and see perhaps the fruit of his, uh, of his hard work at the time. Um, so... In terms of the knowledge economy, briefly, you know, we have uh, quite a large portfolio, um, over 120, 39 billion uh, in the last 14 years. Um, you will see sort of the splits between the different segments of knowledge economy, um, you know, quite a substantial part in the R&D. Um, we have the various sectors, uh, a lot of, obviously, a lot of sectors that in Europe are quite, um, you know, for which Europe is quite well known, the automotive aircraft, TMT sectors. Um, and if you look at sort of, you know, the way our um, lending has developed, there is, of course, a cyclicality to EIB's business. That, you know, certainly when in 2009 a lot of the banks had, or the credit markets uh, were shut down, you know, we of course did step up. And I think this is a natural role, of course, for banks like the EIB. But 
Equally, I would put the case to you that we are also highly pro-cyclic in the sense that, you know, hopefully there is a role for us to further stimulate investment and use our uh, risk um, capacity to, to, to basically um, help mobilize additional private sector funding to support innovation. Um, I would like to now give you a sense of some of these uh, risk sharing financing products that we have. We just had now under Horizon 2020 a launch of a new family of products. In fact, they have been now renamed. You may have heard of the risk sharing finance facility under the FP7. It is now rebranded as Innofin products. Um, we have learned from the seven years uh, prior um, and hopefully have improved and refined uh, the, the product range. You will see now a much greater focus on SMEs, uh, on high growth mid caps, on large caps, and there is a green part, which uh, is in fact what I'm representing, which is the advisory. Um, I put some flyers out downstairs uh, on the table when you uh, arrive at the front desk, uh, which you can take with you if you wish to learn more about the advisory part. Uh, this is an uh, area that was set up um, as, uh, as a partnership agreement between the European Commission and the EIB for the seven years on the horizon 2020, where we are providing advice on multi-stake um, holder projects. In fact, sorry, that, that's the right. Um, we provide project advice um, in, in sort of large-scale projects where there is not an immediate obvious bankability case, so we improve the um, investment readiness so that you know, a a financing can follow and also advise on the optimal mix of the financing, including EIB products, but also really with a view of being catalytic and, and mobilizing private capital. Um, we have then a range of horizontal activities, which are um, basically primarily to further refine the financing instruments to make a case if there are gaps within um, you know, the value chain that perhaps our current you know, financing mechanisms are not well suited to, to, to cover. And um, so pr provide advice to the European Commission for an intelligent, smart use of their grants, whether they should be continuing to spend all of these grants in the same way or actually put more into the blended pool of, of that capital. So it is actually really an area that, that can help the organization to adapt and reinvent itself and, and, and be uh, much more responsive to the needs uh, of, uh, of the innovation. Um, I will perhaps sort of go, um, so I'm like, uh, the value added I presented to you, um, maybe sort of a few uh, sort of samples of projects, for instance, uh, that we are that we have under the advisory, and I'm thinking back of what Carlotta was saying last night, that you, know, you may have all the funding, but if you don't have sound good projects, uh, so there is clearly a role for, I believe, for uh, state-owned banks and also institutions like the EIB to have advisory services to actually deploy their technical expertise, their financial expertise in the preparation of, of sound projects. I believe that this is not only helpful for the um, you know, of course, for these projects to develop, but also as a signaling effect to f further mobilize private sector funding. Um, if we do a good job and if we have the reputation of being an a lender to sound projects, that should give further, um, in a way, sort of further um, catalytic impact to, to bring in uh, private capital. So in terms of some of the projects are... Um, in the, for instance, the infectious disease area, we have right now, we're in close um, discussion with the European Commission, the Gates Foundation, in what needs to be done to further accelerate the development, in this case, of a TB vaccine. Unfortunately, tuberculosis is coming back to the developed world. It's not only a poverty-related disease anymore, um, but more importantly, these, are, uh, the, these diseases have ultimately not the same market prospects. The pharmaceutical companies, if they have a choice between investing in a neglected disease or an infectious disease, even in, in, in a flu vaccine um, or you know, in antibiotics, they usually prefer um, you know, investing in cancer and diabetes and all those more lucrative. And so the question is, what can perhaps institutions like the EIB to do to further uh, give leverage to the grants funding that is ultimately, though it may seem in 
infinite when you look at Gates and when you look at the Commission, nevertheless the needs are rather um, high. So we are working to develop innovative financing mechanisms to help those segments uh, equally in, in alternative energy sectors. Um, you know, it was very interesting to see what the US is doing, but something similar is happening also in Europe under the strategic energy technology roadmap. Um, so all in all, this is to give you a flavor of what we are trying to do to further prepare projects to become more responsive and to use our financing capabilities um, even better to support innovation projects. And so with that, I leave you. So from now on, EIB is the European Innovation Bank and think of also other forms of financing than grants when you look at innovation. Thank you very much. That's admirable. Admirable brevity. Um, we, we have to. We have to. Uh, uh, okay. Next, um, on, in, in order, I'm merely moving down the list in order to my left. Uh, yeah, Carlos Ferrez from um, BNDES in Brazil. All right. I BNDES. Sorry. Yeah. I um, I was going to, but I will not. Uh, have a PowerPoint presentation uh, because uh, not only the time, but also to try to focus uh, the attention of all of you at this time, which is almost impossible. My argument is uh, the following. Uh, where state and private uh, sector are in a more resilient uh, long-term financial industry exists. This is my, the essence of my argument. Uh, and I will go through um, five points. Uh, the first one is that the challenges of long-term financing in a very uncertain and an investment craving uh, world are very great. Uh, we should not un uh, underestimate uh, what these challenges are. Um, and basically because uh, institutions that are capable to take up these challenges uh, that is, with long uh, assets and liabilities are very few. And uh, Turner here uh, mentioned this. So, um, and, and the challenge is that, uh, as Luciano was saying yesterday, uncertainty, uh, which is directly related to long term or to innovation, are not well understood um, and are. Uh, uh, in the four dimensions, time, the technical complexity, uh, the political dimension, or the market dimension. Um, it is, these are challenges that, are uh, uh, that are surround uh, long-term um, uh, financing and that uh, we, should be, we should do much more work, either technical or uh, research on these subjects if we are to design or propose or discuss institutions that are more fit for them. Uh, the second point is that development banks are one of these institutions. And what is more is that uh, they are very common institutions, very, very common institutions. Um, in, uh, uh, there is a Canadian study in 2009 that identified 235 different institutions in 92 countries. They can be export agencies or they can be, you know, um, just infrastructure banks. So they are much more uh, common than uh, what uh, uh, we take uh, as an uh, intuition. Um, and they are very relevant. Uh, there is, a, 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 there is a, a group of, of institutions, of development banks among them, uh, KFW and BNDES, there are 10 institutions. Um, uh, the, the Koreans and the Chinese uh, and the Mexicans and the Indonesians, a small group out of these um, 200 and something. 
they have 2.3 trillion in assets. So this is not, you know, they are economically relevant. Uh, but what is more interesting is that there is no role model. While there is all this concern in the Basel um, world uh, on the BIS that uh, uh, all banks should follow a specific framework, uh, the scale and the scope and the mandates uh, and the, the style of governance of each of these institutions is very different. You don't find one alike. So there is no role model. Uh, and usually they, uh, the design and the way that they are is very much related to the history uh, of each country uh, and to political, uh, um, uh, specific political contexts. Uh, the third point about BNDES. Um, it is very, you know, the scale and scope matters. So BNDES, has 300 um, uh, billion in terms of uh, dollars in assets, half of KFW, uh, and KFW is half of the Chinese. Yeah? Um, but, uh, and, and we are not different from CASA, the Italians, or the uh, Japanese. So this is the first point. But what probably um, uh, it's one of the most interesting features of BNDES is the range of instruments that we operate. Uh, and this provides uh, a lots of flexibility for us to uh, operate on, in different ambiences, in different contexts, in the, uh, to different needs. From grants to uh, second tier project finance, exine, um, um, you know, debt, equity, on the equity, the equity, the venture capital, uh, the seed capital, uh, direct investment. So it provides us uh, with the adequate instruments to face the challenges of long-term financing in a country that has a very shallow financial industry um, and where banks are very short uh, in terms of their assets and liabilities and the interest rates uh, are very high. Um, and uh, what we have found and this is just a, a, a beginning of a long journey that was in the first panel uh, was mentioned, is that uh, the few studies that were done uh, in uh, external evaluations in terms of effectiveness, if we made difference, uh, panel groups, um, you know, studies with all the statistics and the econometrics, uh, they have shown that uh, those that are active uh, uh, have act, uh, you know, active with some of the, the financial instruments that BNDES have, they employ or they invest, they are better uh, uh, off than uh, their counterparts uh, there. Uh, the fourth point in terms of a, a general balance that I can do and the assets of development banks in general. Uh, first in the objective functions. Usually people say that they should, you know, just remain around the, the, uh, the, the the market failure. Uh, we do not use that type of language. Basically, they are banks that finance the expansion of capacity and capabilities wherever they are needed and there is no uh, private market willing to. The second point is that because they are development banks, they also have a mission to develop and to foster a long-term financial industry. So it's not only to the real economy, but also the financial industry, we have a role to play. Uh, the third point is that, um, uh, and uh, uh, Shiva has shown that these banks contribute to systemic stability. So it is the counter-cyclical role that they play is very relevant. Uh, the fourth is if uh, uh, we have to appropriate and we have to distribute to society the benefits of correct financial decisions. Uh, the Treasury loves Benny Diaz. Yeah? Um, uh, and, but the, because we are induced to generate profits, there is a drive for us to be efficient. Uh, so this is very much at the core of our institution. And the fifth point is that uh, because they are development banks, public banks, state banks, they have to contribute to, um, uh, to policy making, uh, to planning, uh, especially long-term planning and to the design 
and the implementation of policy making. So um, in terms of assets, if I can think in terms of assets, uh, they are, uh, we are public servants, uh, competence, you know, and competence of a specific, not only the technical competence, but also competence with a view that they have con to contribute to development challenges. Um, and so these are the, the key assets that we have. And in terms of the challenges uh, that uh, banks have, in order, in order not to say that uh, we are great and uh, that's it, uh, the first point is to maintain and to search for a stable source of funding if uh, banks have loan assets and liabilities. The average, Luciano was mentioned yesterday, uh, the, the average loan of BNDES is 10 years. Uh, the second challenge that we face is to engage in the financial industry in the Brazilian case. But uh, because there is no role model and each country uh, uh, and, and development banks are time and place specific, uh, this engaging uh, takes different facets. So at this moment, and uh, uh, Mr. Cable yesterday was mentioning, uh, the British uh, developed the Green Bank and the small uh, size in a, in a country that has this financial industry, you know, a very strong financial industry. Mind you that after the war, there was a fund, there was a development bank in this country that uh, was, uh, uh, that disappeared a few years ago. So when people say, no, because KFW has 40 or 50 years, the British had it, and they put it aside. Uh, in Mozambique, they are just beginning to develop a development bank and financial industry in Mozambique is probably uh, a bit uh, uh, more shallow or shallower than the Brazilians. Uh, so each one, you know, the configuration of the private and the state is very specific, but, uh, but there must be this partnership. Uh, the, 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 the third challenge is a double one, is we must develop evaluation methodologies, especially uh, for risk uh, taking of high risk uh, projects in order to provide the confidence uh, for us to put money um, and also to attract uh, 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 people willing to take uh, resources. Um, you know, evaluation methodologies for high risk uh, operation is key. And the second one is we must develop innovative instruments that are adequate to the problems, the stage of development of different actors. And this is a, a challenge that uh, a knowledge of the local uh, 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 ambience is very important. Um, the, uh, the, the, the fourth point, the one, two, three, four, the, the fourth point is regulation. We are subject, um, you see, uh, we are in the world of a, a, an international regulation that uh, is telling to the banks that they have to strengthen their capital base uh, that induces no long-term financing. Yeah? How do you face a challenge where you know these uh, regulations are becoming internationalized, and a development bank. Yeah? Um, the uh, there is another one, which is the more that we f uh, that we search for the stable funding, uh, the more that we probably have to rely uh, on treasury. Uh, the more that we become dependent on treasury, and there is no. Um, 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 uh, sustainability, long-term sustainability. You have always to depend on a given fiscal and political context. Um, and uh, uh, and the, the most important challenge is that uh, the capacity that we have to follow the challenges that each country has and to follow and to be adequate to the uh, political uh, agenda of each country. Final point. My time is over. Uh, given this, I don't know how many of you, the, the one that remain, have an idea of the importance of this institution called development banks. Uh, not only, uh, so I want to make a call that more research is needed on, external research is needed on this institution. It is an institution 
under, under, under research relatively to their economic importance. And um, in this direction, you see Leonardo Boulamar, the head of a think tank called Minds, is on next Monday and Tuesday organizing a seminar in Rio that, uh, uh, to discuss the future of development banks with academics and uh, development banks. So uh, this is an initiative that we should. Uh, Paul has answered already. Right? Huh? No, no, it is just the beginning. Yeah, okay. Just the beginning. You know, the call for this, and there is a society call uh, for uh, to understand not only as a research in itself, but a society call to understand more. You know, the pressure that uh, KFW and BNDES have from the civil society to be more transparent, to demonstrate what we are, is very high. So, please do yes. it. <laughs> I love that because it's so nice to hear people talk about finance as part of a whole econo economic structure and culture, as part of the, the web and weave of, of, uh, of the economy. If we thought more in those terms, we'd have more research to do, but we'd also really understand finance a lot better. Um, we, we have now um, Vivian Lowe from KFW. Um, you've been, the stage has been set for you very nicely, so it's, it's done. So the good news is, this is the last PowerPoint presentation you have to endure before you get your drinks. <laughs> uh, so I'll, I'll try to be very brief and, and very to the point because I, I feel that my two predecessors have, have covered really the main points um, that have to be made with regard to, to state investment banks. And that I feel that we've, we've got so much input in these two, stay, two days already that um, I, I fear if I go too much into detail, it would only confuse the, the larger picture that's starting to emerge. But still, we've had uh, a lot of references to KFW, which of course I'm very happy about. So you might be a bit curious about what, is, what, what kind of organization is that? And who is, who is KFW? So KFW is the promotional bank of Germany uh, we are a non-profit organization and we go back longer than the Re Federal Republic of Germany itself. We, we, there was a law uh, for KFW um, that started even before um, the current Republic of Germany started. Um, the beginning was the Marshall Fund. After, uh, after the Second World War, um, the Marshall Fund money in Germany was put into the European Recovery Fund, and that is the start of all the activities of KFW. Of course, since then, we've, we've remodernized ourselves much. We have a lot of restructuring. We have changed also, of course, the focus of our promotion. While back then uh, the focus was on reconstruction of, of houses and of, uh, of the economy, today we have a much broader fo focus. We focus on, of, on SMEs, uh, in which innovation and startups, of course, is one of the main points. But we also do education financing, uh, we do energy efficiency financing for houses, and we do export and project finance and promotion of developing uh, countries. So all in all, um, last year we put out uh, over 70 billion, of, uh, 70 billion euro of soft loans, of grants, and of equity. And how do we get this money? We um, refund ourselves on the, um, on the capital market. We have a state guarantee by Germany uh, that's um, with a triple A rating, um, very favorable refunding conditions. And with that, and with, with additional um, budget money from the government and from the EU, um, we can reduce interest rates of our soft loans, we can offer redemption for years, and we can um, offer fixed interest rates. So we direct this money into investments where we have high social, um, uh, very high, uh, positive social impacts. And the two main priorities of our promotion are first, um, environment and climate, uh, and the second is domestic SME. 
So the model uh, of KFW rests on, on six crucial elements. Um, and I'll just go quickly through them because just to give you a picture of how we function and, and where we come from and what, what role we are able to play uh, in the innovation system of Germany. First is, as I already mentioned, government ownership and guarantee is essential for our, our funding situation, of course. The second, operational independence. We work like a bank. The government is giving us the mandate and uh, is, is, um, the law governs which activities we can engage in, but um, how we implement um, these programs, how we do our promotion, this is in the day-to-day -day business is um, totally independent from the government. <coughs> Third, subsidiarity. For us, it's very important that we, the, we go into markets where there's not enough private investment, where markets uh, fail or have weaknesses. Then the on-landing principle is the fourth criteria. Uh, we do not, or uh, only in very, very small areas, we go, give direct loans. We usually do on-landing. That is, um, we refinance loans that the private banks give out f to find the customers. So it's, it's a division of labor between the commercial banking sector and KFW, and, and each one, um, each one uh, concentrates on, on their expertise. And there's also a sharing of risk between public and private sector in this. Promotional loans are our preferred instruments, although we also offer, as I said, equity and grants. <coughs> And the long-term perspective, of course, uh, I would always say is one of our most defining um, elements. Um, most of the loans we give out have um, uh, run up to 20 years. So from the model to, um, to the innovation problem in Germany. Um, and this is, this is where sort of my expertise comes in, because I'm from the uh, economics department of KFW. And what do we do in the economics department? We provide data on how the economic structure in Germany develops. So every year, for example, we ask uh, 12,000 SME, how is the access to finance? How is the investment situation? Uh, what are problems with innovation? Um, and actually, uh, the innovation questions we ask only every, every second years because the picture is always the same. It's like this. The most important problem for innovation as in SME is um, access to internal and external financial sources. So financing is essentially the most problem for SMEs to innovate. But as I pointed out yesterday in my provocation, financing is not everything. You see a long list up there. And I want to draw your attention to the fourth point on the list, shortage of expert staff. So this is, this is something, as an aside, that um, us in Germany concerns very much. Demographic change is going to hit us very hard in the next years. Over the next few years, we're going to lose every year 270,000 um, people of our working population. So shortage of expert staff is something that's going to become a much bigger problem in the next years. And so we're also looking into that. We're not all, only providing finance for innovation in the SME, but also uh, pro, uh, providing education finance, because education, um, if the popula uh, population shrinks, education is uh, one of the main um, priorities in our um, point of view in order to keep innovative activities up. So this is just uh, uh, more in detail the principle of our on-landing system. And because time is short and I see everyone's uh, full of information already, I won't go into detail here, but of course uh, afterwards at the drinks or so, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to explain it. Um, the basic principle is that we work together with the private sector. and that. That goes also for our equity financing system. If we provide equity, we always do it um, together with a the, with the private lead in, uh, investor. So to sum it up, um, this, is, um, this is what we offer um, in innovation programs. There's a, there's a long list of different programs targeting different problems of innovations of startups. I won't go into detail here. Just so you know, we offer 
very small loans up to 100,000 euro. We offer up to 10 million euros uh, loans, very different conditions, depending on what type of SME you are, whether you're young, whether you're in innovative, whether you need equity or, or loans. So a diverse um, supply of finances. But I also want to um, go to the other priority I was mentioning before, um, climate and, and environmental protect, protection. Because when we talk here about mission-oriented ori financing, of course, uh, in Germany, you have to think about the energy transition. And the energy transition is maybe one of the, the largest challenges that uh, Germany has, or the largest um, projects that Germany has set itself in the past years. Um, again, uh, KFW is, is providing very different uh, programs to target all the different areas um, in order to get the energy um, transition going. And this is really a long-running project requiring a lot of funding. We estimate that until 2030, every year, uh, around 40 billion euro have to be invested in Germany in order to, to achieve the goals that we have set ourselves. Um, and this is also where, where I'm saying our role is not only to provide finances uh, to achieve this mission, but also, uh, for example, setting standards. One of the most prominent programs here is um, um, the promotion of energy efficiency in housing, in, in uh, reconstruction housing. You may have heard of that. And uh, we have set certain standards. You only can get, you, you get different promotional benefits de depending on how much, how energy efficient your house is. And so you have the KFW House 100, which is a sort of standard um, um, with the legal requirements. You have the KFW House 70, which is 30% more energy efficient, and you get different promotional benefits. And these standards have really um, transpired in the market because they offer transparency for investors. If you want to buy a house and you see it's a KFW 70, you know what you're getting. So it's really um, providing, um, providing regulation and standards for the development of the new markets. And I'm coming to my last, last point here I want to make, that um, as my, my predecessors al al uh, already pointed out, the main point um, that um, distinguishes us from private banks is that we really try to look into the future. So we're not only looking into the next five years, we look into the next um, 10, 15, 20 years. And we see that um, there are three major challenges for Germany, for Europe. One is environmental and, and climate protection, the next demographic change, and then, of course, ongoing globalization and, and innovation. Um, and KFW is constantly monitoring whether, um, we, whether the programs we um, offer are on track in order to turn these challenges into opportunities for the German economy, for Europe in general. So um, the, the lookout, the view we have, is always uh, with a look to sustainable future. And with this, I would like to close. And innovation bank and not just patient capital but thoughtful capital. Um, we have a, a discussant now, um, a response um, from Matthias Kolatz. Thank you very much. First I have to disappoint you in one respect because actually I have a few slides. Um, <laughs> are they there? Yeah. Okay, so um, I just wanted to want now to start, uh, the slides will then come later. So we heard from, from Edward in the, um, in the beginning that this is a kind of a unique group with some, with some unique features and he said it's very, very close to the original banking model which was uh, very much on social purposes and so on and so forth. But you have also learned from the presentations that there is no unique name. Huh? 
we have heard that it's sometimes called a development bank, sometimes called an infrastructure bank, sometimes called an investment bank, European investment bank. The guys there or the ladies want to change the name. Uh, so, and um, the Germans call it promotional bank. Uh, so, so therefore it's, but we talk about the same group, but we have their, but we have their different, um, we have different names. And this is coming from the, this is coming from the different, um, historical perspectives, but however, um, the model, and this I think is, a, is an important message, is more converging. So why it is converging? Because perhaps before the financial crisis, the one or the other were thinking that these banks will disappear sooner or later. But what we see now is that there are new players coming around. Some of you may have read in the press that a new development bank was just initiated after the football championship, which was much more important, huh? so as, as Germany won. So therefore, um, therefore the, um, the, however, there was a small bank was, uh, was created and, and this, yeah. and this, <laughs> and this new, and, et cetera. and this new, this new development bank, um, so we are here, huh? No, 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 Yeah. It so, already disappeared, yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, no, there is. This new, this new, develop, <coughs> this new development banks are, <coughs> here it is. This new development bank is, just to, to, to remember, as Shiva said, um, the EIB is the biggest one huh, of, the, of all these animals. What is now created, this new development bank, has equity-wise the same size as the EIB before the recent capital increase. Because 10 billion of, um, of these will be, um, will be paid in. Then others are under construction, the Asian Infrastructure Development Bank in Portugal, in Ireland, in France, and in the UK. This was already, already discussed. So new promotional banks are created. And we heard of the, if you so want, inaugural speech of, of Mr. Juncker um, when he was on the way to be supported by the parliament to become the next president of the European Commission, that a further increase in the EIB's capital should be considered. So we see new players and we see increasing asset and liability schemes of this. So it is not something which is uh, disappearing and it is, and this is I think an important message, it's converging. So, and the public mission discussed is obviously, as we have learned, um, access to finance missed by many SMEs, sometimes related to innovation, sometimes also more in general. We have here uh, no representative of the promotional banks of the European South. They would have told us that the access to, to finance, very general, is a very big problem. Then long-term lending, this was very well explained, I think, um, at the Brazilian example, and catalyzing innovation um, where we have um, the high risk and the uncertainty question. So I now come to the other, other slides. What are the com common features? This is now a little bit banker stuff. No retail business, they have a wholesale approach. Borrowing on the markets mainly, this was explained with the rating of the, of the state owners. But please be aware of that these promotional banks are not only a kind of a subset of the state, because this you can see that sometimes due to a good asset book and a good banking practice, if this is achieved, then the conditions may be better than those of the owners. And um, Shiva was perhaps a little bit too, too shy on this. If you look at the average rating of the European countries, you will find that it is not triple A as a, as a financing of the EIB is. So then um, we see also, even if I said that the model is a kind of converging, we have seen in a lot of speeches, we have seen that the state plays a, um, plays a bigger role in, in venture capital, which is a little bit um, a surprise. Venture capital was invented to see not such a big place of the state. And I have this graph because it is also showing that it is not only up to 50% what the state is doing, it's actually more. Huh? This is a picture of Europe. And one should not forget that the sovereign wealth funds are also, um, are also state. 
A lot of those which is here under insurance companies is state-like and close to state, but certainly the pension funds are in most of the cases is state money. Huh? So therefore, altogether, we are there fairly above. So what is the change of the paradigms? And I think this is a whole provocation of the, um, of the conference, and there I will try to close this. In the old days, life was easier. One had said, um, okay, if there is something new, if there is a new industry or, or a new kind of business type, a new sector, then this has to be protected. It was usually protected with customs or uh, whatsoever regimes, import barriers. And then if they are more mature, we create, um, um, we create full, um, full competition. The paradigm which was often referred to now in the discussion, what we have in the EU is public financial intervention is governed by the concept of, um, of market failure. And if you remember the last panel, you have heard from, from our expert there from Denmark that he said we can really only make this if we go for the second and the third round in those which are promising. This is one of the big fights in the EU discussion if you look at the European level, because usually the second and the third round is considered a state aid. Huh? So therefore it's forbidden. And now there is a discussion about a new state regime that there should be some relaxation in this. So perhaps there will be more room of maneuver. But behind this paradigm, there is an assumption that the private sector is always efficient. Is this right? Our chair said, um, Look at this, the idea to, to create banks was a, was a different one. Huh? And um, the promotional banks claim also a role, this we have learned from, um, from the KFW, claim also to, have, to play an important role in the global challenges. So do the market forces, this we have heard in many of the panels, do the market forces um, in the financial sector lead to investment in the financial sphere instead of the real economy. This was called financialization. There were a lot of examples being presented. How to change the heavy underinvestment in most of the countries. And there, I think, just to give you one of the figures, if you look at Germany, which is often discussed now as a success example, Germany is heavily underinvested. So, so the investment, the overall investment of the economy is below 17%, one seven of GDP, which is an unacceptable, um, unacceptable low figure if you want to, um, to preserve the infrastructure and to develop new ones. Huh? If you want to develop new infrastructure, you need much more. Energy was mentioned and also ICT services. So, and then there's also the question of the power of revolving instruments. We have heard a lot during the whole day about revolving instruments. And basically, we see a paradigm shift, I would say, from giving grants to going more in the direction of financial instruments. And public institutions do this often, also parliamentarians, because something is scarce, and this might be budget. Um, at least in the, uh, in the European um, context, it, is, it will not be possible to continue with a regime which is relying mainly on grants. So revolving instruments have to be developed further and if we look at most of the venture capital funds, if they really revolve and on the most uh, guarantee schemes and on the most loan schemes, if they really revolve, then this could create um, a much higher level of investment in the future instead of a lower one. Thank you very much. Perhaps we have stuff to discuss. I want to thank all of my, the people on the panel for being well within time. I think we were, I don't think anyone was over our 10 minute limit. Maybe there was one minute, so that was very good. Um, and I think at the end of the day, everyone in the audience will appreciate that. I, th I think it's a very interesting set of comments um, and the kind of tension between um, market orthodoxy, which suggests these institutions shouldn't exist, and if they do exist, they should do as little as possible and historical reality, which suggests that these institutions have very important roles to play, um, not merely as filling in gaps, but as um, integral parts of financial systems at different levels of development and different historical contexts. 
um, and I think that tension will, will help shape this history. But now is time for questions from the floor. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure about that. I'm interested a microphone is coming your way within uh, seconds. Okay, thank you. Um, that was a really interesting set of presentations. But earlier in the day, we heard a lot of conversations about, from Adair Turner and others, that in effect, there was too much debt more broadly in the system. And so I'm interested what given the, the development banks that you all represent or have worked with, they're talking about both increasing the debt and also the equity supply, not just grants. Are you seeing that the proportional increase will increase more on the equity side, like BNDS supporting Grand Bio, and maybe less on the debt side, or do you think that there's a chronic underinvestment more broadly across the two? Um, who wants to take that? Yeah. I can certainly start because the other part that I heard in Adrian's presentation was that the debt is in um, real estate um, and uh, you know transfer of ownership, and I think one thing that certainly on the EIB side, uh, you know, we are actually one of the rare textbook banks, I guess, that do invest in capital investments, uh, um, and you know, so we have rather tight eligibility rules. Um, therefore, I mean, I guess the use of the debt is perhaps also something to to look at. Um, uh, having said that, I mean, you know, clearly uh, we're not suggesting that one needs to over leverage. In fact, and I think the bank is rather conservative in its own assessment of, of, of the profiles. I mean, referring to our loan book needing to be of high quality so that we can retain the, the, the good funding conditions. Uh, this, this is a drive of our business model. Um, so I think, I guess the case that we are making on the blended capital is that actually those companies that we are right now targeting in innovation usually have had no debt. They have so far been funded by the family, friends and fools. Then they may have had some private or some venture capital or, uh, you know, uh, VC funding. If they're lucky, maybe some additional equity funding. Um, so they are not the ones that are over levered that we are coming into with potentially an innovative financing instrument that is blended and has has a debt feature. So that is, I believe, uh, an important element. You know that we're not contributing to that. We're in fact giving them access to to the debt markets, which I believe is an important. Okay. Yes. No, I, uh, I two numbers uh, of total assets, fifteen percent is equity related, right? Returns, net income coming from that portfolio, average 2007, 2013, 40% comes from. 40% of your profit profits comes from equity investment. Which is 15. Yes. So it's good business. Yeah, very good. No, 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 wait. But we do not operate only funds. It is of our interest public, national, sitting, uh, having a relevant stake in the national oil company, in the electricity company, in, yeah? So, um, and it is of our interest to support those companies that can have a leading international position, whether in software or in protein. So, I'm in this game. Okay. These presentations were excellent. Um, I'm curious, I was really interested in Joao's uh, comment, there's 300 or so development banks. Mm. And there's also a lot of silos. In the UK, we've got the Green Investment Bank, the New Business Bank. Uh, there's a number of entities just in the UK. But my question is, is really about the commercial investment banks and venture capitalists. I, I don't think there's any in this room. I mean, perhaps I'm wrong. So my question is, how difficult do you guys find it? How hard is it to interact with conventional mainstream finance, whether it's the venture model or whether it is the institutions or the commercial investment banks? You actually interact all the time. I mean, the, the whole model is that you work through. Is that right? Yes, we have a, a, the KFW model. Of course, everyone does it differently, but. Um, we work extremely closely together with the commercial banks. They are uh, they are our key key customers. That's how we call them. 
and we are in constant um, interaction with them about how do our programs work, do we have to change it, how is the reaction on the market, because they sort of are, are, are our eyes and ears on the market, because we don't have any contact with our final clients. It, all, um, it always goes through uh, the commercial banks. Oh, um, well, th there are always, in every relationship, I would say there are advantages and disadvantages. Um, that being said... Um, That's true at any level, human and uh, institutional. <laughs> uh, we've, we fare very well with this online uh, model because um, the commercial banks have an expertise that, that it would be extremely costly for KFW to build up. Not, uh, if you think about all the local branches that you would need, uh, if you think about the expertise in uh, examining projects, we don't have to do that. We can concentrate on what are the promotional goals, where, where do we want to go in a general scheme. And the commercial banks are doing their work uh, with the final customer. So it's, it's really a very good division of labor. Yeah, and I, I should add, just for those who aren't familiar with the German banking system, it's not like the UK where you have four banks that gave up on SME lending as an unprofitable bad business many years ago, um, and they took away most lending decisions from branch managers. You have you know, low, relatively small Sparkassen. Yeah. And, and very strong com savings banks and, 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 and mutual and banks. Mutual banks. So so it, it's actually yeah. much more designed to support an SME economy. Matthias, one thing. In Germany is also, if you so want, uh, perhaps uh, as we heard about the uh, number from Joao, is a world champion on promotional banks because Germany has 20. Huh? So um, each region has one. At the, at the national level, there are um, a two, if you count the export credit agency as well, then it's, uh, it's three and so on. So, um, but the main point is that you see there's not one size fits all, and this is the main important, this is the most important point. If you look, um, there is a new country uh, now uh, has recently accessed uh, the, the union, this is, um, this is Croatia. In Croatia, the promotion banks actually is the biggest one in the country, and, and more or less the only one which has a, a kind of a domestic ownership. Similar situation you find in a country like Slovenia. Then you have other countries where you have more or less no no promotional banks, uh, like UK, where you, where you were referring to. But, and this is an interesting thing, if you look at, at the European level, as we are here in Europe, there is a new class of promotional banks um, developed, which is about a balance sheet volume of about 10% of GDP. Um, so, and this is, really, this is really developing, and all of them have some borders, so they do some businesses, some others they do not. They are not allowed to do the whole, whole uh, fields of business which one could imagine. And they have some maximum levels of financing. So, and usually this is 50%. So, most of those banks are not allowed to finance in a project finance, even if they go direct, more than 50%. There are exceptions, uh, micro lending, start up lending, things like this, but by and large, you had a more general question. So, and if you look, this was one important industry development. If you look at, at the, um, the offshore wind parks, huh? the, the, techno the technology is not yet fully through. But everybody believes that sooner or later we will see this. Um, but, the, but the big ones, these projects are one and a half billion, billion euro. Huh? So, um, the, usually a consortium typically, typically is there that um, let's say the commercial banks to 500 million, the EIB does 500 million, and as we had just the KFW on the table, the KFW does 500 million. So, so are these projects financed. And you see all of them, they have limits. They don't go for full financing because this is also a kind of, an, um, of a viability test or that there are also others who believe perhaps that this could be a success. Just to give you more a taste because I, I had the impression that you are asking for this kind of picture. Marianne. So I guess this is mainly to um, Zhao, but actually perhaps also to um, Vivian, which is what actually happens to the returns. So if, you know, one of the accusations, I know at least to BNDS, is that lots of the investments are too much in, in particular companies that what? are... 
in, in the, some of the giants like Petrobras and Vale. And I think that one of the defenses, which I would you know, encourage, would be that actually because you invest in a portfolio, precisely you have to have some returns from the more, you know, from the incumbents, from the easier, the less uncertain investments to then fund the high risk ones. So the first question is, does that actually happen? Is it true that these safer returns that you're generating from Petrobras and Vale then get reinvested into the high risk innovative areas? Um, what evidence actually is there for that? And also, is it true that about 80% of those returns go to the treasury? And what evidence do we have of what happens then to that money? Is it reinvested back into the economy in particular areas? Yeah, and fiscal, is that <laughs> determined by where the money comes from in the first place? It used to come from workers' pensions, right, or the, their contributions, the fat. And now it's coming mainly through just money creation. Uh, the, the last one. Yes, 80% in average, and not only in this government, and it has been a long history of providing the Treasury with nice uh, returns that, uh, you know, just fills up their chest. You know, that's whatever they do, it's, the, the, you know, it's, it's, it's the budget. It goes to it. Yeah. On the high low, it's not Petrobras in Valley against the high risk. Because on Petrobras, and you took two cases, yeah, Petrobras in Vale, we, we find, Pet, Petrobras, the Brazilian oil company, large, yeah, and Vale is the iron ore, like BHP, and, and, and you know, this large thing. Uh, they are financed from different sources. Uh, we take, for example, in the case of Vale, the, the next um, mining, large mining, $20 billion, huh? we take, 15%, and this 15% is the long duration, is the railroad. It's not, yeah, on, on Petrobras. It is the drilling ships, $1 billion each. Yeah, that, so, uh, now, it is true that we finance shopping centers, but at rates that are completely different than when we finance innovation. So there is a, uh, the priorities are very well designed, and even in infrastructure, a new infrastructure has a pricing, just to be short, uh, completely different than a, a, a brownfield. So, you know, we try to balance f by the nature and the capacity of the, uh, whoever is taking. Yeah? Okay, so, but, so you, basically pay out a big chunk of your profits and are expected to do that as part of the, the, the mandate of this. But you don't pay out any profits, right? You've ever paid a dividend? Once. <laughs> Matthias knows, obviously. Yes. Um, well, I mean, so the, um, the EIB's retained earnings are being then, they kind of self-finance its capital increases. So in, I in will some tell our treasury to go to the EIB. <laughs> <laughs> And KF, uh, KFW is the same, right? You don't, yes, you, you have don't. never paid a dividend. No, right? that, uh, what, what, oh, what, oh, Luis. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Actually, next huh? Well, yeah. no. If I, I can, I, so, if I return, if. Can yeah. I make, can I uh, make a question related to this? Is precisely whether does it make a difference that you are uh, funded by the treasury and? or you borrow directly no, from the market. Each one of us is financed completely different. Yeah, completely different. So KFW what are the implications? Is tax free. I pay, uh, well, Benny Dess pay taxes just as a commercial bank. Well, we what are, are the implications of the Just model? as a commercial bank, KFW is not regulated. So they are different models, yeah? We have a, a stable financing source from a, a, on the constitution from a, 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 a specific fund. Uh, from the crisis zone, we got uh, loans from the Treasury, long-term loans. Now, think this. This is $200 billion that we receive in, in five years, right? Now, uh, the QE is what? It is money to the banks and the, and the banks to, to strengthen their capital base and the lending, the trickle-down lending is, there was this Dodd-Frank on the, uh, on the uh, Financial Times saying that the banks are okay, but there is no increase in growth. Uh, the uh, Irish, the I in Ireland, and I think here, uh, Irish, uh, uh, their, their fiscal position before, be, before the crisis was one, and after the crisis, to save banks. What the Brazilian Treasury did, 
The, the Keynesian is the budget that finances work, public works, blah, blah, blah. Yeah? Uh, on uh, the Brazilians, what they did is from the treasury, a loan to Benny the S that provide loans to the uh, private sector. So there is, we ensure not only the quality of the, this process, I think the efficiency uh, in terms, if you think uh, in terms of the financing out of a crisis, uh, it's more, it's, I think it's higher than the, the traditional Keynesian or the, the, the so praised QEs of life. Yeah? So it's a different uh, model. Yes, that's a very interesting point. Well, we have time for, I'm, I'm told we should end at 6.20, right? Sharp, right? So about one or two more questions um, in the, very, the back there, yeah. Hi there. Um, we've, we've talked um, and heard a lot today about failure of, um, within innovation. Failure is important. Um, it's part of the process. We heard it from Google and from others. Um, I'm interested to know, as people who run development banks, what your tolerance is for failure, whether that's your tolerance or the, the tolerance of those who are funding you, um, how, how it's decided, and um, do you think it's high enough? Okay, I think that's a really good question. Let's, let's go from left to right here on that. What's your loan loss ratio? How about that for a start? <laughs> Banks are banks, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's, um, it's an excellent question because really, really, this is for us the between Scholar and Charybdis question. Um, how much do we go into the risky, um, risky business, I would like to say, uh, and how much do we keep on the safe side? Because if we have too much loss, of course, we run into difficulties. Um, if we only pick winners, it's not what we, uh, uh, what we as a promotional bank aim at. Um, so what we're, what we're trying to do is that um, if we, that for certain um, innovative projects, uh, we exempt the commercial banks from liability in order for them to, to give out the, those loans, because otherwise they would not do it. Uh, but we, we get for ourselves a state guarantee from, for, uh, for that, um, either state or from the EU. Because our system um, is not sustainable over a long time if we, if we as a bank take too much risk. So, in a nutshell. I, I would say that is a bipolar situation, yeah? <laughs> uh, you see, um, if we take too much risk, uh, the, that is a, a, a it is already, uh, Benedes uh, in its um, equity, you know, direct equity investments uh, in the past seven years, um, in, uh, you know, something like a hundred, uh, there were two or three or four or five uh, failures. This provoked an outcry. And, 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 and you, when you stop and say, if, if Benedes does not go into mistake, this is a new entity, yeah? Capitalism without failure. Which is, yeah? Um, so, so this is one. Uh, but we have to minimize because there is all this regulation stuff. Uh, but see, banks are banks. This is a development bank. And banks, they are tough on, on the negotiation and asking for guarantees. Maybe to even, you know, very conservative, too much to the conservative side. Um, <laughs> you can ask Bernard. <laughs> uh, but, you know, the investments that we do in Granville, this is a risk, pure risk. So what do you do? Uh, not only, you, you know, you put the upside clauses and everything, you know, it's a long negotiation. But that it, you, you try to understand and you try to see not only that the guy is a good manager, but it has, the company has the competences to face a given risk. Uh, you know, because it is risk. It is, so it is a challenge. But, uh, so it is a bipolar thing, um, you know. Uh, good, okay. Um, one, one short example, um, the, um, it's also published. Huh? Uh, the European Investment Fund was taken over as a majority shareholder by the EIB. It's now more than 10 years ago. So after 10 years, one does evaluation, and this evaluation is 
The basic idea is that something like the European Investment Fund, which is, as you have heard earlier this morning, for one third or so of the, of the venture capital financing uh, which goes around Europe. So a sound understanding from a banking point of view is that it is a kind of a revolving fund. Huh? So, and what, what is there developed? Uh, the steering model is like this. If too many losses uh, shine up from the venture capital side, they have to do more on the private equity side where it's a little bit more easy to, um, to reach different results. But by and large, this whole revolving fund has to be geared to, to achieve something which at least balances the inflation or so. So, and there you say, okay, there might be several funds where you have total losses, but these have to be overcompensated, and if you don't do this, if you don't achieve it, you make a mistake also as a promotional Portfolio. bank. Just to, just to give you one example, and Shiva has others. Maybe just very briefly, I mean, um, again, I mean, do we have enough of a risk um, appetite or culture in the bank? I think it, is, it has evolved. I mean, certainly the, uh, what I mentioned to you, the, the FP7 risk sharing finance facility um, gave the bank an, a really good opportunity to develop a greater risk appetite. In 2005, our bank had a policy of taking more risk for more value added, and that had to be translated into actionable points. But uh, what I would say is that we need to, again, it's all in the balance, and we need to retain our AAA rating, which has been fundamental to our business model. Therefore, the, this blended capital model is in fact really an, um, a win-win for all parties. The Commission, by putting its grants into a revolving facility, uh, gets more leverage you know, uh, than just putting the grants in a one-off uh, you know, investment. And on our side, we get a first loss piece, so our initial losses are covered, and that way our residual risk effectively uh, requires less capital to be put aside. I think this win-win allows us to take more risk without you know, jeopardizing, in a controlled, calculated manner, without jeopardizing, of course, our overall you know, portfolio. I, th I think we're going to stop here because we're right at time. But I just wanted to give a closing thought, which is someone was asked before about what financial innovations are impressive and the answer was the limited liability corporation company. The other answer that people used to give is some um, uh, ATMs, cash machines, um, or direct deposit into your pay, you, you don't get checks. But, um, but actually, you hear here a lot of interesting kinds of financial innovation, um, or at least financial adaption, where you have very complicated programs that effectively share risk and return in ways that are socially acceptable um, and economically helpful. And I think the whole idea of these um, state investment banks is that they actually are very innovative in, in their structure and in their support of the economy. And I think we've heard um, a very, very persuasive examples of how these, these kind of new financial structures or revised or constantly evolving financial structures can actually also help new reviving and constantly evolving economic structures in the countries where, where they operate. And I just want to thank everyone for participating and thank you all for paying such good attention. Thank you.